Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. New Jersey Resources. Wells Fargo. Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. And by Johnson & Johnson. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Wounds are... Uh, Things people think they know about, but we have someone in the house, uh, the doctor's in the house to tell us all we need to know about wounds. He is Dr. Asad Samra, who is medical director at the Center for Wound Healing at Bayshore Community Hospital, part of the Meridian Health System, right? That is correct. Um, doctor, talk to us about wounds, and what's the difference between a, I hate to call it a regular wound, versus a chronic wound? So we break them down between acute wounds versus chronic wounds, and an acute wound would be a wound that basically just happened. And typically speaking, an acute wound would heal within a few days, potentially, or within a few weeks. Once a wound has gone beyond about a four to six week period of time, we then call it a chronic wound. There are people that were more disposed to having a chronic wound, perhaps those with diabetes or some immune problem, maybe those that are bedridden and therefore are constantly putting pressure on an area. When a wound is in a chronic stage, we need to figure out why it's in a chronic stage and then try to bring it back into a more appropriate wound healing capacity. But go back to the diabetes question. The, the, um, there's a member of the United States Congress who, who represents New Jersey, uh, Congressman Donald Payne. We just had him on our sister program, Capital Report, who's been dealing with a chronic wound, who has diabetes, and he's talked about it publicly, so there are uh, no confidentiality issues. And he's been very public about the fact that, that that's an issue. What is the correlation between diabetes and a chronic wound? I appreciate the question, Steve. It, it really is the fact that diabetes results in a high blood sugar in the bloodstream. That high blood sugar affects the ability for the body to heal. In addition to that, specifically in the feet, it can affect the ability to feel, and therefore people can result in having small scrapes or cuts in their feet and not even know about it. And therefore they're now walking, for example, outside with mm. an open wound, unaware of it, that wound gets infected, and then by the time it becomes aware of or the patient becomes aware of it, they have a much more significant problem. Diabetes, as you know, is a major issue in our country. Almost 30 million people have diabetes as the statistics show of 2014. And so we're seeing a lot of people coming to our wound care center with wounds and they're not <coughs> healing because they're diabetic. Let's do this. We're about to talk about uh, hyperbaric um, oxygen therapy, right? Correct. Um, and I know about this because the doctor and I have uh, worked together before. I want to disclose this. I've done a whole range of leadership uh, training, in fact, actually for physicians at uh, Meridian for the last couple of years, and so I've learned a little bit about this, but we're about to show some photos as you talk about this. Uh, ex exactly what is this therapy and why is it so important as we look at these photos right now? What is this and who's a candidate for it? So in our Center for Wound Healing at Bayshore Hospital, we have two hyperbaric oxygen chambers, and essentially a patient who has perhaps a diabetic foot ulcer that with a significant infection, maybe involving the bone, for example, that would be a situation where we would want to, in addition to the wound care, do some hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Why? Because by putting them in the chamber, we increase that chamber's pressure with 100% oxygen. That forces oxygen into their bloodstream, and now at a higher concentration of oxygen in the bloodstream, their body can fight the infection that's in the bone, for example, and help heal that wound faster. But, but Doctor, who's a candidate for that chamber, and who is someone who you say, you don't belong in there? So there can be medical reasons. Perhaps their heart can't take that pressure or their lungs can't take that pressure. And if they can't take the pressure, then it's not safe for them to be in the chamber. Other examples would be wounds that are not appropriate. So if I was to have a bad even car accident for that example and have a bad cut on my leg, maybe with an open wound component to it, 
that's still an acute wound. We wouldn't necessarily want to treat that with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We would want to treat that with more traditional modalities first. Typically speaking, it has to be a very significant infection or part of the body where there isn't appropriate blood flow. And we've now reestablished blood flow, mm -hmm. and we want to, in addition to the reestablished blood flow, put more oxygen into that so, area. So, but doctor, if, if it's in your foot or your leg, why are you putting the whole body into the chamber? Good question. Just putting the foot into a chamber and pressurizing oxygen there, the oxygen does not seep into the skin. It actually has to go into your lungs, and then through your lungs, it'll go into your bloodstream and then flow throughout your entire body. Okay, but I'm thinking to myself, okay, you go in the chamber once, and it, it, it deals with it. Do you go in multiple times? Right, so it's actually a pretty significant commitment on the part of the patient. It's an every day for about four to six weeks, and each treatment is about two hours. So it's a significant commitment on the patient. It takes us about five to six dives, as we call them, to actually get that blood oxygen level high enough where we feel mm -hmm. that we're making an impact. And then that sustained period of that four to six weeks results in those positive outcomes that we see. Why is it that seniors, people who are just a bit older, or maybe I'm wrong about this, they tend to have more chronic wounds. You're absolutely correct. Or is there that. That, is that correlation? Yeah, that place? correlation is correct. And, and some of the most recent st scientific literature is showing that we have something in our body called a mesenchymal stem cell. What is and, it? A mesenchymal stem cell. Which is? And the mesenchymal stem cell actually is almost like the traffic cop during a wound healing situation, telling the different cells what to do and where to go and how to heal the wound. What we find is that when we're born, we have a significant number, millions of mesenchymal stem cells. And as we get older, that number steadily decreases. In addition to that, if you have some comorbid conditions like diabetes, end-stage renal disease, hypertension, that also negatively affects your mesenchymal stem cell count in addition to perhaps affecting the blood flow or sugar issues, as we had talked about, that affect the capillaries. So you're absolutely correct. There is a higher proportion of wounds that we see in the older population, especially because we tend to develop diseases as we get older as well. Final question. Can we prevent certain wounds? 100%. One of the things that I think is paramount is constantly checking your feet if you're a diabetic. Checking your feet? Looking in between your toes, looking at the bottom of your feet. For what, cracks, what? Exactly, any cracks or minor injuries that you would not have noticed otherwise because of not having good sensation in your feet. That in and of itself could prevent a significant portion of the diabetic foot ulcers we see. You're doing important work, doctor. Thank you. And uh, I have a sense that there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about wounds, and uh, you helped clarify a lot of that. Dr. Asad Samra, who is, uh, by the way, comes from a great family. Uh, anyone else in your family in the medical field? My father and my brother are both plastic surgeons, and we're in practice together. Well, you're all doing great work. Dr. Asad Samra, medical director at the Center for Wound Healing at Bayshore Community Hospital, part of the Meridian Health System. Thank you so much, Asad. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. One-on-one -on -one will continue right after this. Stay with us. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are here at uh, Hollywood Golf Club. I'm here with uh, Frank Longobardi. Uh, we're doing this in June in the sweltering heat. It's humid here. Uh, it sure is. But I'll tell you what, there's warm hearts here because this is the uh, <clears throat> 24th annual Cohen Resnick Foundation Charity Golf Invitational. Cohen Resnick Cares. Frank is, in fact, coming in in October um, when this program will air as the CEO of this great organization. By the way, let's talk about this event before you talk about you becoming the CEO. Let's talk about this event and why it matters so much. We just interviewed Joe Torrey, not just about baseball, but more importantly, his Safe at Home Foundation. Um, why is this event so important, Frank? Well, we, we really try to instill in our people um, one real trait, make a difference, okay? Make a difference in the lives of other people because we're all very fortunate, we're all very lucky uh, to have, uh, you know, what we have. And uh, we try to get our people to be excited about giving back to the community. If you think about our founders, you know, Julius Cohn, mm -hmm. David Resnick, you know, those were traits that they instilled in their firms from the beginning, and that's carried through. And uh, it's just really important. And uh, we try to do that in all of our uh, training with our people. Uh, any uh, time we talk about strategy 
It's all about how do we how do we make a difference in in the community and the people Giving that back. we work with. Yeah. And by the way, just to be clear, it's not just the, uh, the Safe at Home Foundation, the Joe Torre Safe at Home Foundation that helps victims of domestic violence. <clears throat> it's also the Special Operations the Warrior Foundation. I mean, these folks are, are extraordinary. Raising money for the children um, of great men, soldiers who have been lost in special operations uh, fighting on behalf of our country. I mean, you've been here. We've been, Frank and I have been part of this event with the team for a long time, um, helping to raise money. You've been here listening to, we've heard some of the students Right. Some of the children of these uh, great soldiers. What's it been like for you, especially yeah. since you're going to be heading up the organization? What's it like when you hear those students? It's uh, you know it just uh, opens your heart. You know it really does. It makes you feel so good to be able to help out. When you think about what the Special Warriors uh, Foundation does and in the way they counsel children, they provide scholarships, they provide grants, and they're giving these kids a life. Um, and they may have lost a, a father or a mother. Uh, it just makes you feel really good. You know, it's what you, it's what you do, it's what you want to do as a person, you know, in giving back to, uh, to others. How long have you been in the, uh, talk a little bit about the accounting business. How long have you been in the business? I've been in the business since 1977. So uh, I started out with a smaller firm, uh, worked until uh, 1984 with uh, two different firms, and then uh, decided to start my own firm. And uh, my partner, Bob Haggett, and I built it uh, over 23 Haggett years, Longobardi. Haggett Longobardi, 23 years, and then we merged with J.H. Cohn in, uh, eight years ago. So here we are uh, eight years later, and I've got the uh, fortunate to, to be the uh, next CEO of the organization. What's that like for you in terms of, it's one thing wanting to become the CEO, right, after a few years in the business, but as you're coming in as a CEO, the responsibility associated with that. I mean, you and I have talked offline about that, but what's it like for you? Tell our audience. I feel uh, a huge responsibility, okay, because the responsibility is not only to our people, you know, which I have to make sure that we're providing a great workplace, it's to our clients and that we're always attentive to their needs and always looking to uh, provide additional value added services as required. And then the third, I feel a big responsibility to the community, you know, and as an organization we have to make sure we're giving back to the community. So when you lay on our people, our clients, and our communities, uh, it, it is a it is a huge responsibility. I take it you know take it very seriously. We're talking with Frank Lombardi, the incoming uh, CEO of uh, Cohn Resnick, in a very soupy environment. Uh, you know, usually we're in our studio. It's it's like David Letterman. He's not on the air anymore, but he would have a studio at about 50. And I know why because it's very cool. And, but we're just praying that the weather holds up. That means it doesn't rain, but it doesn't mean it's not uh, 100 and humid. Um, but I got to ask you something, Frank. The accounting industry has changed dramatically. And if people say, oh, ac accounting can't be interesting. <laughs> but you and I both know, I mean, I'm a con you know, I do yeah. a lot of executive coaching, leadership development. I always say this on the air to our broadcast friends, public broadcasting. I do a lot of leadership development, executive coaching. So I've learned a little bit about, not about the, tech, the techniques of accounting, but about accountants themselves. What are the biggest misconceptions about people who go into accounting? <laughs> well, I think the first thing, if I had a dime, for every time someone said to me, you must love numbers, I would, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here today. Frank, I'd, you love I'd, numbers? Be, I'd be retired. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you love people. I love people. And I, I, and I used to get defensive and I used to start to tell them, no, it's not about that. Now I just say, yep, I, I really do love numbers. But uh, it's, uh, you know, today accounting is, it's all about people. It's all about how you treat people, how you train people, how you respect people, how we get our people motivated to service our clients. It's how we communicate with clients. It's all about communication. It's about uh, enhancing value. The numbers, you know, come into play now and then, uh, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how do you deliver the information, how do you analyze the information, and how do you work with, you know, making sure that you're delivering value every single day to our clients. I asked Joe Torrey this question, so I have to ask you as the uh, incoming CEO. Greatest leadership lesson you have learned in your few years uh, in the industry? Greatest leadership lesson, what is it? Never take anything for granted. You know, I think, and what I mean by that is sometimes you, you, you rise up in an organization and you do not realize the impact that you can have on people. And you have to make sure that every single day, no matter who it is, that you're, you're giving quality time to those people, you're listening, uh, and, and, you're, and you're, you're taking more than you're giving. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's really important. I think people want to feel that their leaders care about them, that they respect them. I, I did hear Joe say that you have to treat people Joe differently. Torrey. Yeah, Joe Torrey. Say treat all players differently. Right, and I, and I agree with that. But don't take anything for granted. You know, understand your role, understand how important it is to an organization, uh, and, and work with those people. And, and, and listen, we've got a mentor, right? We all had mentors in our lives. And uh, to me, what I try to pass down to a lot of the, you know, a lot of our partners and a lot of our senior managers is that you have to mentor the next generation because they're our future. Wish you nothing but the best, Frank. Looking forward to it. Great firm. Thank yeah. you, buddy. Thank you. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Dr. George Abanza, who is uh, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at the great Felician College. Good to see you. Great, great to be here. Thank you. Describe uh, the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, well, we uh, are liberal arts uh, focused and also the sciences as well, including the social sciences. We're very uh, broad. We're the largest uh, school of the four schools at, at Felician. And the mission of Felician? Oh, boy. Well, uh, it's the heart of it all, right? So uh, mm. it infuses our curriculum throughout um, in all of our programs uh, and a uh, great motivator for all of us. Yeah, and the president there, Dr. Ann Prisco, and I have had lots of on-air and offline conversations about the work that uh, you and your colleagues do. But th the thing that we have you on here to talk about, which so fascinated me, you're originally from Nicaragua. I was born there, yes. Mm -hmm. But that is part of your work, part of what you do with your students. You actually take your students on a field trip every year to Nicaragua. We're going to show some photos here, your native country. And you do what with them? As we are showing these pictures, this is, you call it a transformational experience? It, it, it is, Describe and of course, it. one of our uh, Felician values is uh, transformation. So uh, here's Ed Bodner, a former uh, valedictorian and teacher education major, uh, who's now working in education in a New Jersey school. Uh, here we are at the Comedor, uh, helping to feed children. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, multifaceted experience. Uh, a lot of it revolves around uh, spending time with children. So here's a center where, um, children are uh, high risk uh, in a very already poor area of Managua. Of course, Managua is one of the yes. uh, second poorest capital in the Western Hemisphere. And these children are at high risk for there is neglect or abuse possibly going on in the home. And so they're brought to the comedor to make sure that, that they have a semblance of the normalcy in, in the day and children are cared for there. Uh, this is uh, an organization we work with where our students are able to put together these wheelchairs that are then donated to, to the public. and so. Uh, we're, you know, 40 wheelchairs, 25 wheelchairs, and it's something that they can actually build and leave that's concrete uh, in the country. Uh, here's Agape, uh, mm. probably the poorest school, I think, in, in Managua. Uh, and we're talking about six little classrooms, uh, over 150 children there. And uh, no electricity, uh, no lighting. Sometimes you go in there and it's a dark day and you wonder how the children can, can see, can, can read the, the, their books. Uh, and, and yet they, they survive, they persevere. Uh, here's a farming cooperative, also part of the program. Uh, like I said, it's very multifaceted. These are uh, uh, poor uh, workers, farmers, who uh, join as a community uh, to take care of uh, fields. These are uh, papayas, uh, which are very lucrative for them. What do the students uh, get out of it? They, you know, they, they get whatever, uh, you know, there's so many different things you, you can get out, right? Because people are different. And so uh, my, my purpose is to simply expose them to, to this, to give them access. I think education is a lot about access. And so, you know, my, my initial experience was as, as a child, four years old, living there, my mother taking me to a very poor area of the town and, and seeing the, the dirt of the outside uh, of the home, the same dirt as the inside of the home. And, and it struck me. And ever since then, you know, I, I thought that there was something uh, important about uh, a place like that that needed to be understood by, by us, especially in an affluent society. So the students, um, I think, learn uh, they had direct access to different people, a different world. Uh, they get to go out of the classroom, uh, so it's very much experiential learning. Uh, and transformational in the sense that it changes their perspective on things. Um, and, and the idea is not so much, you know, they'll go back and start an orphanage or work what at a do clinic. They do but with it? Well, while they're there? No, no, when they come back. What kinds of changes have you seen, Doctor? They come back, even if they don't go back to Nicaragua, 
and, and do whatever, and some yeah. do, I'm sure. But when they come back, do they change their perspective on what they may want to do with their lives? I, I think absolutely. I think that you know they come back, and many will, will tell you, and it's been 44 students now in seven years that have gone on the trip, and uh, many will tell you uh, they just don't see their lives the same <laughs> anymore, and the things that they took for granted for so long, uh, they just simply cannot see uh, their fellow human beings in the same Priorities way Priorities change? I think so, and, and that's really the idea, changing uh, perspective, and we all need that. I mean, I, I enjoy the, the reminder every year, even though I know about life there, uh, you know, I get a little comfortable uh, in my ways, and, and it, it just uh, reorients me into what really is important. These people persevere through so much. Um, they endure, and, and that's another thing to me, that, that our students are able to see how young people have so much resilience. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Well, I think about Felicia. We, we interview a lot of people in academia, Felicia and other colleges, and uh, at the end of this program, um, uh, something I'd rather not do, and be talking about the, uh, the gentleman, Ray Bermucci, the, uh, the late chairman of the board of, of our production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation, who was the person who actually introduced me to Felicia. Right. When he told me about Felicia, he said it was a special place because, not just because it was a, a Catholic institution, a lot of Catholic universities and colleges, sure. But he said that th there was something about the spirit, something about the people, something about what it was they were trying to do, and also who it was, who, you know, the students who were going there. What did he mean, you think? Well, you know, I, I started there in 2000, so I just completed my 15th year. And, and uh, since the beginning, uh, there's been a, a sense of, uh, there's a serenity there um, that, that I felt as, as a faculty member. Um, and, and I think there's something about a sense of community there. I, I know students who weren't real in my community? classes. A real community. A I, college, I, I, a real community. I, absolutely. And I think that the, the size of the college obviously helps, but, but there's something about the people there, the presence of, of the Felician Sisters. It's a Franciscan institution at heart and not only is it uh, part of its uh, mission statement but but it's something that we try very hard to live throughout mm. and the other initiatives that the uh School of Arts and Sciences, talk about them. Yeah, very exciting, lots of different things going on. Uh, we uh, just received an NSF grant uh, for a quarter million NSF dollars. NSF stands for? A National Science Foundation grant uh, for a quarter million dollars to um, develop a uh, cybersecurity lab. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it's providing all the computers and programming for that, and as well as uh, curriculum design. Uh, so we'll have a cybersecurity. We already have a concentration in that in the undergraduate major in computer science, but now we're moving towards a computer science master's degree. And so there'll be a cybersecurity concentration there as well. Uh, we're looking at uh, the development of new interdisciplinary programs, so social behavioral sciences, humanities. Uh, we're looking at four plus two programs where we have our students complete the undergraduate degree and move right into our graduate programs. We have a master's in uh, counseling psychology, mm. right? So students can do their undergraduate major in psychology or social behavioral sciences and, and transition into the, uh, the, the graduate program. Let's spot real quick. Sure. I used to talk to Ray Rubinchi about this all the time, leadership. Biggest leadership lesson you've learned in your work at Felician or as a professional, real quick, biggest yeah. leadership lesson. I, I think uh, servant leadership, uh, trying to make others better. Trying to make um, others better. Yeah, you know, being a facilitator. You know, <laughs> now my, in, in my new role as Dean of Arts and Sciences, which is uh, fairly new, uh, I, I try to solve problems and uh, I try to uh, facilitate uh, things for people so that they're able to excel, so that they're able to achieve good things. Make other people better leaders? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think everyone uh, can assume a leadership position um, and, and are certainly, you know, using their abilities and skills. It's not about uh, power in a forceful way, but, but uh, empower people right, to, to, do, uh, to do more, to do as much as they're capable of doing. Yeah. I want to thank you for joining us thank and you for uh, sharing me. these important messages about the work you're doing and keep up the work in Nicaragua. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Now the uh, message I wish I didn't have to deliver, but uh, he's more than owed this. My good friend and mentor, Ray Bramucci, who served as the longtime chairman of the board of the Caucus Educational Corporation, the uh, not-for-profit company that produces this broadcast, passed away recently. Ray was an extraordinary public servant, but an even better friend and a better human being. He served in many roles, including the former chief of staff to United States Senator Bill Bradley. He was the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Labor, assistant 
Secretary of Labor in the Bill Clinton administration, a trustee at Felician College for decades. As a former labor leader, he really understood working people and he cared for them deeply. There will never be another Ray Bermucci. He was smart and wise in ways that are so difficult to describe. And the lives he touched are immeasurable. On behalf of everyone at the Caucus Educational Corporation and the entire public television family, we will miss you, Ray. Thanks for everything. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Choose New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, New Jersey Resources, Wells Fargo, Qualcare Inc., and by Johnson & Johnson. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.